All right. Welcome, everybody. It is we're a little bit early, but we've got a lot to get through here. So I'm going to go ahead and get started now. Um, so welcome. Thanks for joining us uh, today. We're going to be talking about uh, neonicotinoid alternatives. Um, now, before we jump into it, a few housekeeping things really quickly here. You'll notice that there is no chat box. So all questions if you have them, can be put into the Q&A box, and we will get to them at the end. We are scheduled for a 30-minute webinar this afternoon, however, or morning, depending on where you are. However, we might go a little bit over. So at 12.30 or at 30 minutes after the hour, if you need to jump off, please do. You'll still get your credit. Yeah, this is worth one ISA CEU. However, if you'd like to stick around, we're going to probably hang out together until about 12.45. Um, so just uh, keep that in mind there. If for whatever reason you forgot to put your ISA CEUs into the registration box when signing up for this webinar, you can go ahead and put them into the Q&A box right now, and we will make sure that you get credit. And last but not least, uh, we have plenty more webinars uh, coming up here over the next few weeks. You can find them by going to rainbowecoscience.com. If you go to the the uh, education tab and hit events, you will find them. There's probably another half dozen or so that we have scheduled for this winter. Um, so plenty to uh, plenty to learn there. Uh, and then finally, at the very end, I will put up, you'll see an ISA CEU code. That is just for your reference. There's nothing you need to do for that. But if you want to keep uh, tabs in your personal records as to what you've done, uh, you can feel free to jot down that code. And without any further ado, let's jump into it. So as I said, we got a lot to go over, so I'm going to very quickly introduce myself. My name is Mark Ware. I'm an arborologist, and I take care of primarily the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic United States, providing technical support and in-field training and PhD education, that sort of thing. You'll also notice that our other hosts here are, are as Jessica, and we also have Allison. They're going to be keeping an eye on the chat, keeping um, tabs on any questions that get put into there. And then at the end, we'll cover that. If you have any uh, technical issues, feel free to throw something in the chat. And they'll be monitoring that. Um, so today, like I said, we have a lot to get through. This webinar is also going to be recorded. So don't feel bad if you miss something. It will be available afterwards. So you can go back uh, and review anything that you, you that I maybe you know went through too quickly on. Uh, but we're going to talk about what neonics are, kind of why they're under scrutiny, and then, obviously, the, where the money is, the alternatives to them. What can we use in place of these products that maybe are uh, under scrutiny in your area, or maybe they're just not allowed to be used in your area anymore? What can we do as alternatives or supplements? So, you know, without making this, this isn't an update on legislation, but I want to give a little bit of context as to why we're even talking about this. Um, there have been many, many states that have limited, restricted, or just outright banned the use of neonic products for ornamental trees and shrubs. And so some of these states, it's a it's a brand new thing. Some of these states have had had legislation in place for a few years now. Um, and then there's always new legislation coming down the turnpike as well. New York just passed their Birds and Bees Act, which also restricts neonic use in, in New York as well. So there's always something new. If you have questions about this, uh, you, you know, the DEPs in your states or, or the, the folks that oversee the pesticide laws in your states, they're great resources. Um, alternatively, you can always reach out to us as well, and we can help uh, help you navigate through any potential uh, legislation like that that, that might be a, uh, around your state. So that's that. Now, what are neonicotinoids? Now, neonics, they were released back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, that's when imidacloprid kind of came on the scene and it took the industry by storm. It was originally released, obviously, for agriculture, was used widely in agriculture very, very quickly um, and, and then spread from there. So imidacloprid, for most of us that are familiar or that, that work with pesticides at all, it's probably one you're familiar with. It has a very wide range of uses. Um, and it's used all throughout many, many industries, especially ours. They are one of the most commonly used insecticide groups in agriculture and landscape. And we're going to talk about a little bit why that is. 
But essentially, it's because of how low their relative toxicity to mammals and birds are. Pre previous to neonics coming on the scene, we were using primarily organophosphates. And organophosphates had um, sometimes a much higher impact on birds and mammals. And so now we had uh, new products, this new group of products that not only worked really, really well, but also was much lower toxicity. So it was kind of like win-win. Now, unfortunately, there were things that popped up as it, as it got used more and more widely that we'll talk about. But that's why these, this, this group of pesticides really became so widely used so quickly. And it's become such an important staple in our pest management toolbox. They are also generally all systemic products. So that you can do, you know, apply them as a soil application or a low volume bark spray. Um, so you're no longer having to go and do big foliar sprays and spray in entire trees uh, and shrubs. And so they had a lot of advantages. Um, and then since then, uh, you know, you come to the present day, not only now do we get all those advantages, but also they're, they're quite economical. Some of these products you can get for very, very cheap. Um, and so they're much more accessible to us now more than ever um, in the industry, which is which is a really nice thing. Now, the few in, uh, there's a few of these. The ones that we probably are most uh, uh, aware of are imidacloprid and dinapefuron. And, you know, these come in a variety of different trade names, but chances are pretty good that you've used one of these or both of these if you're in uh, you know, if, if, if you're in the arboriculture landscape maintenance industry, we also have products, acetamiprid, clefiandin, thymethoxam, that they're also, um, these are also classified as neonics, not as widely used, but certainly still out there and certainly still get their fair share of use in the industry as well. The reason that we love these things is because they are really, really, really helpful. Like I said, these things are a staple of our pest toolbox especially when it comes to a lot of our invasives. So for those of us that are dealing with spotted lanternfly or hemlock woolly adelgid uh, or Japanese beetles, emerald ash borer, these are all significant um, uh, uh, pests that neonics do a fantastic job of managing. Um, and so we're going to talk about today some alternatives for some of these pests that aren't neonics, but this is, this is the key here. Without neonics, there's a good chance that, you know, we wouldn't have as many live hemlocks or, or ash trees as we already as we do, um, because these things have created such a, a, a been such a valuable tool for managing these pests and preserving the health of these really important trees. Now, like I said, with every good thing, there are also sometimes bad things. And unfortunately, although neonics did prove to be much lower toxicity to mammals and 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 humans, they are significantly they can they can significantly impact populations of our pollinators. And I'm not just talking about honeybees here. There are tons of different species of pollinators out there, and a lot of them can be negatively impacted by improper use of neonicotinoids. And so, unfortunately, back in 2013 there was a very uh, high high profile bee kill as a result of improper off-label application of neonicotinoid product. Unfortunately, this happened, it was like at a target parking lot um, and there was um, an application of dinatefuron put on linden trees in the parking lot and uh, it was put on during bloom, and what ended up happening is, depending on which article you read, there was anywhere from 50,000 to 250,000 bumblebees that were killed. But we obviously know bumblebees, they're pretty dang big, and so when you have a lot of them dead on the ground, they're easy to see, especially when you're in a parking lot of a very popular store. And so this got a ton of news coverage, and this really started, um, you know, all the way back in 2013, really was what triggered a lot of the scrutiny that we're dealing with still to this day and are going to continue to deal with. And I'm going to tell you right now, the big takeaway here is for those of us that still do have these in our toolbox, it is absolutely critical that we're using these products responsibly and correctly. And by that, I mean, we're using them by the label. We're using them responsibly. We're thinking about alternative products that we can use and making sure that 
just because maybe these are the easiest or quickest to apply or they're going to make us the most money, looking at also other management techniques to either supplement them or replace them in certain situations. I'm not saying that neonics are bad. Don't get me wrong here. But I am saying that there are times where maybe they're not the best option and we want to do something, use an, use an alternative product uh, or something of that nature. And we're going to talk about those products here today. But the key thing here is that we're, we're not, you know, not getting lazy or complacent. We're following IPM principles, focusing on, you know, cultural control and other things as well, utilizing other products that may also be helpful in management and following the label directions. That's really the big key there is following the label. Sounds simple, but it can be missed. It has been missed, clearly. Now, for those of us who don't have the option, Right. There's a lot of us probably on this this Zoom today that maybe we don't even have an option anymore. We just can't use them. And let me tell you something. It sucks. But let's look at this as positively as we can. I'm not going to say it's all sunshine and rainbows because it's not. The fact is we've lost a very valuable tool and that, you know, there's no way around it. It's a bummer. But this is also an opportunity for us to maybe look at some products that we've just previously ignored or underutilized um, that, that can also be a, of a big benefit to us. Um, okay, so with that, we're going to start talking about some of our systemic alternatives. We're going to focus primarily on these four, uh, acephate, abamectin, amamectin benzoate, and chlorintranilaprol. And we're going to talk about chlorintranilaprol a little bit, but you'll see there's an asterisk there, and I'll talk about why that is in just a bit. Now, the reason we're not focused on some of those others in that chart there is because some of those products um, are organophosphates, including one we're going to focus on quite heavily. Uh, but there's a couple products that are alternatives that I included in there because some of you may be familiar with them. And I think it's important to address it. And it also brings up a really important thing when it comes to just pesticide use in general. And that is looking at the toxicity or the the risk behind some of our products that we're using. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, hopefully we are pretty familiar with it, but you can see all labels will have a signal word of some sort with caution generally being the lower, you know, lower risk with danger poison being pretty significant risk, pretty high risk to mammals and birds. And so those first two products that we focus that, that are on that list, oxydamentin methyl and dicrotophos, those both have danger poison labels. And although they are quite effective at controlling pretty a pretty wide host range of pests, because of that danger poison label, it's not one that I'm going to endorse or even really recommend you use. To be honest with you, I don't even think you can find products out there anymore that have those two active ingredients in it for our use case. I think there was one that was available that that was actually pretty much pulled up from the market last year, I think, everywhere. So you really can't even get these products. But it's also a really important just just concept to bring up and, and, be, and you know, to remind you of is always pay attention to those signal words. That's going to be a really good clue as to what kind of product you're using and kind of just how. Uh, you know, maybe maybe those those higher those warning and danger and danger poison products. Maybe those are the ones where we try and find alternatives to as well. Now, the that first one on the circle list there is acephate, and this acephate this is an organophosphate as well. However, this one comes with a caution label, so it's as an organophosphate. So we would certainly want to be aware of that because there are risks that come with organophosphate use, but. As long as we're, once again, all, regarding the label, reading that label, and doing what the label tells us to do, wearing our PPE, applying it by label directions at the right time, at the right rates, with the right equipment, we can really reduce our risk as applicators quite significantly to where we don't really need to worry too much about, you know, some of that other issues. By following that label, we're going to be able to mitigate a lot of that risk. Um, and because it is a caution warning label, that also tells us that our risk is lower in general. Now, once again, organophosphates were the predecessors, essentially, to neonics. And when neonics came, they all but antiquated organophosphate use. But 
Acephate is one of those products that is still widely used and is going to become one of our more widely used products as we navigate these neonic restrictions. And you can see why. You can soil inject this stuff and you can trunk inject this stuff. And once again, just like that previous two we looked at, these control quite a wide range of, of, of pests. What's really cool about acephate is that it's also effective against mites. So while most, in most cases, uh, our neonic products were not good in miticides at all, uh, with acephate, we kind of get sometimes a two for one deal, right? We're able to control both mites and insect pests with uh, maybe the same product. So it does have some really cool benefits to it. Um, now, it's also quite effective on, on, a, on, like I said, on a pretty wide range of, of pests. We'll look at a few here, but because for the sake of time, I'm gonna kind of burn through some of these data slides um, just to make sure that we can cover everything we need to cover. Um, but you wanna miss scale, uh, canker worms, Japanese beetles, these are all pests that traditionally we may have transitioned over to using neonics for. And then I wanted to quickly, just because I, you know, as I was going through it this week and preparing, realizing kind of the time restriction that I put on myself here, I wanted to kind of put these slides in there. And these are pests, once again, where traditionally we would be using things like Zytec, the midacloprid, um, um, Dinotefuron, Tristar, all these, these different products. These are ones where Lepitec might help kind of uh, uh, replace them or supplement them, depending on where you are. So you can see the lace bugs. I saw a question before we even started coming in about lace bugs. Um, Lepitec works fantastic on lace bugs, azaleas, rhododendrons. Um, uh, I think uh, there's a few of them out there, sycamore. Um, a few of our scales. Now keep in mind, Lepitec or acephate is definitely not going to be a one-to-one -one replacement. There is no such thing. Right now, you know, we're losing neonics, but there's not another product that we can just plug right in and is going to solve all those, those issues. However, Lepitec does check the box for quite a few of them. And so for scales that especially feed on uh, leaf tissue at some stage in their life, that's where Lepitec and acephate's really going to thrive as an alternative management technique. Lepitec is not going to do well on scales that are feeding on woody tissue in general. However, for scales that do at some point in their life cycle feed on, on leaf tissue, we can use it then as an alternative and we will still see somewhat decent control, sometimes even really good control with the use of Lepitec. Um, same thing with, with leaf beetles, um, willow, elm, hawthorns, uh, Japanese beetles, white flies, and mealybugs. Once again, this is a product that I would highly encourage you to explore as an alternative um, because it will work quite well on a lot of these pests. Now, to finish up with Lepitect uh, for right now, a few things that are really important when it comes to Lepitect is that unlike some of our um, neonic products like imidacloprid and, and Transtect, where we can get six months to a year, sometimes more of residual activity out of Lepitect is going to be into the plant, out of the plant relatively quickly. Acephate moves very, very quickly throughout the plant tissue, which is why we don't get good control on woody stems, but we do on leaf tissue. It moves to the leaf tissue very fast. So after application, one to three days, this product has moved through the whole plant. But the problem, well, not a problem, but the consideration to keep in mind here is that it's also out of the plant very quickly. In some cases, that could be a benefit to us um, because it's gonna be out of the plant in 30 to 45 days. You're never gonna see more than 45 days of residual activity out of an acephate product. It just moves too quickly and breaks down very quickly and is out of the plant. Um, so sometimes reapplication is necessary, um, but really timing your applications um, in accordance to the life cycle of the pests that we're trying to manage. So our timing is going to be much more critical to get nailed down here uh, when it comes to Lepitect applications. And so that's that. Now, the next product we're going to talk about is abamectin. And abamectin, once again, is one of those products that is usually primarily considered a miticide. However, we do get some really good control on some insect pests as well. 
The benefit here is that it comes in two uh, formulations. One is a uh, root flare injection where we're injecting it via a Q-Connect or, or a, a root flare injector device of some type. Um, and then we also have Lucid. Now, Lucid is a spray formulation. You're going to be doing a foliar spray with that product. However, they're both abamectin, uh, and I believe they're both 2%, uh, but don't quote me on that. Um, so they both kind of will, will cover the same host range. And what's really nice about Lucid is that it, it it's going to answer the question that I think is a big question on a lot of people's minds, and that is boxwood leaf miner, because quite frankly, up until this point, probably most of us dealing with boxwood leaf miner has been using imidacloprid product to help control it. And so when we lose imidacloprid as a, as a tool, um, man, there's really not many great options. And with boxwood leaf miner having such a short adult stage, it's really difficult to control with traditional bifenthrins and other foliar insecticides. It's just a really challenging pest to control without the use of systemic products. Um, but that's where Lucid really comes into play. Uh, that's why I wanted to specifically put Lucid in here, even though we're really talking about systemic products. Lucid is a translaminar product, meaning you spray the top of the leaf surface, it's gonna move through that leaf tissue to the bottom of the leaf. So you get better coverage just because of the way it works. And also because it's moving through that leaf tissue, it will control leaf miners that are feeding between the, the, the outer layers of that leaf that are feeding inside the leaf. Uh, once again, timing is critical because depending on where you are, you're going to see leaf miners, the adults emerging generally in late spring, maybe early summer. Um, but really late spring, kind of that May time frame here in the Northeast Mid-Atlantic region. Um, and they're going to have, they have a relatively short adult stage, and then they're laying their eggs. So generally, our lucid sprays, we want to be applying right after eggs are laid, which will be about two weeks after you see the adults start to emerge. Um, that's when we're going to get the best control. And once again, because lucid is also a miticide, sometimes we can get lucky and also control some of our other mite issues that we see on boxwoods as well. So I would highly encourage you to check out Lucid as a potential alternative for our, our boxwood leaf miner uh, issues out there. Now, the next one we're going to look at is m benzoate. And for those of you unfamiliar with m benzoate, this is primarily what we're using for emerald ash boy. This is how we save ash trees. It's used widely. There's many different trade names you can get it um, under. But it tends to get pigeonholed into just EAB treatments, but there's so much more that we can use it for. As far as it's labeled pests, we have quite a wide host range. Now you'll see that uh, I think there is actually, there used to be mites were on here. Uh, spider mites is on here. I'm not gonna recommend you use m magnet benzoate for spider mites because there's just quite frankly, much better products out there. It'll be a very expensive and time consuming way to manage spider mites in most cases. However, um, there are there are use cases for other pests. So like I said, it's very, very effective at controlling um, e emerald ash borer, which you can see the picture here, untreated versus treated. But it's also great for other boring pests. And I'm not talking about boring like you're, I'm putting you to sleep boring. I'm talking about things like two-line chestnut borer, bronze birch borer, ash lilac borer, um, ambrosia beetles. Emmectin benzoate can be very, 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 very effective at controlling these other boring uh, flat-headed borers, clearwing borers, and then some of our, our you know, sort of bark beetle species as well. Um, now, when it comes to especially ambrosia beetles, remember, while it may kill them, it's not going to do anything to control that that fungus that they transmit. So a lot of times, emmectin benzoate, and when, we, when it comes to the borer conversation, it's used to supplement other management techniques as well. So just keep that in mind. We can also use m benzoate to control a lot of our leaf feeding pests, like winter moth, for example, or Japanese beetles. Um, and, and in this case, it's important to note here that you're only going to get a year of control out of an m benzoate uh, injection for leaf feeding pests. 
Um, you'll get two years, sometimes maybe even more with EAB and some of our boring pests because it stays in the woody tissue better, but it does not move into that leaf tissue the second year very well. So at most you would expect probably about a 50% control the second year after application for our leaf feeding pests specifically. So just an important consideration there. And also when we talk about signal words, not all MMAC and Benzoate products are the same. So there are higher rate products that are available. And some of these are restricted use and also come with that higher signal word warning. So you can see there's a 9.7% active ingredient that has uh, a warning signal word associated with it. There's, it's also a restricted use product. Then there's also the 4% formulations, which generally will carry a caution label, be a little bit less um, um, risk and also are, are usually not a restricted use product. So just some key things to keep in mind there. Now, to wrap up with our systemics, I, I told you we talked about chlorinchronilipril. Most of you probably know this by the trade name of Celeprin. Um, you also probably know that it's extraordinarily expensive right now. It's a very expensive product, but it works really well. One of the really cool things about the Celeprin or chlorinchronilipril is that it actually does not come with a signal word. Um, it, the, the risk is that low, and that's pretty dang cool. Um, now, this is primarily going to be used as a foliar spray. However, there is some data out there that shows that it can be effective systemically uh, as a soil application, but that data is limited and also can be quite varied. So I will not at this point kind of endorse this as a systemic alternative, but as a foliar spray, I think it's an excellent option um, for a lot of our lepidopter and caterpillar species, as well as things like Japanese beetles. It's a great product if you're dealing with Japanese beetles on roses, for example. Um, Chlorinchronilipril is very, very low toxicity to pollinators, which makes it a fantastic tool to control Japanese beetles on a plant that flowers the whole dang summer. Um, so that's where chlorinchronilipril can really thrive as a foliar spray. And that's where we're going to kind of wrap up our systemic products, our systemic alternatives for right now. But we're not done because there is another product that I want to highlight here. And this is a product that is also a foliar spray, but this product has a lot of value. The one thing that you probably noticed that we haven't really talked about as far as alternative products to are some of our scales. We highlighted some of the scales when we talked about Lepitect. But really, those were only the scales that fed on leaf tissue at some point. There's a whole lot of other scales that are out there. And so that's where a product like Proxite, which is the active ingredient pyroproxifen, some of you may be familiar with the product Distance, which is the same thing. These are both pyroproxifen products. But Proxite is a fantastic product because it's an insect growth regulator, which also leads it to be a reduced risk or pollinator species. It works in, in a few different ways. One is it's a juvenile hormone mimic, meaning that it's going to keep pests from molting into their adult stage if applied at the correct time. It will also help sterilize females. So even adult females that it comes into contact with will not be able to produce offspring or at least not as many as they normally would be able to. And finally, it works as an oviside, meaning that it can help lessen the vitality of uh, eggs. So it, and, and it's even effective against the egg stage in, in some capacities as well. So you can see right away, this is a fantastic product. It kind of gets overlooked sometimes, though, because it is a foliar application. And we have all these great systemics. Um, but Proxite is going to become an extremely valuable tool. It already is, but it's going to become an even more widely used tool as we lessen uh, our applications of neonicotinoid products. Uh, so highly encourage you to, to explore that. Um, you're going to use this basically on scales, any just about any scale. Uh, you're just going to need to target your applications when those scales are in their immature crawler stage. That's where it's going to be the most excuse me, the most effective.
Uh, it does come with a caution signal word. There are a few things to keep in mind with this with this product is there are a few extra PPE requirements when it comes to using this. You do need protective headgear, a hard hat, um, and also uh, you have to wear a, an apron when cleaning, mixing, or loading. So there's a few little things, not a deal breaker at all. Most of us, we should already have this stuff on our trucks and in our gear boxes already. But if not, make sure if this is a product you're going to begin to use that you do have that stuff and that we are using it. And that, my friends, is uh, where we're going to start to wrap up. So quick note, it is 1230. So for those of you, uh, if you are in a time crunch, feel free to drop off. I've got about another five minutes or so of presentation. And then I want to talk to uh, address some questions that, that came in. So if you need to drop off, feel free. But also feel free to stick around for a bit if you if you want to uh, you know continue or have questions. So as kind of a wrap up slides as, as a few wrap up slides here just wanted to talk about you know so this is basically what we're left with. This is the take home message here, right? So the products that we're losing, the neonic products I've crossed them out with some of our uh, uh, these are our spray products. Didn't talk about horticultural oil, but I'd imagine most of us are familiar insecticidal soap our bifenthrins, our, our kind of our synthetic pyrethroids, we're all familiar with them. They're on here. I just threw them on here because I don't want you to completely forget about them. But also, we kind of know what their limitations are already. Um, so this is just kind of a nice quick little wrap up slide for sprays. Uh, for tree injection, once again, whoopsies, these are our alternatives. As I said, oxydement and methyl dicrotophos. I doubt you can even find them on the market anymore. But if you do, be super, super careful with them. And there's some there's much better options. We didn't talk about azadiractin. Um, if you were up in Canada, you would be kind of you would you would be using that product a whole lot more. But fortunately, here in the states, we have products that work um, a little bit better, um, as primarily being emmet and benzoate. And so you can see once again, so when it comes to tree injection, we're looking at lepitect, emmet and benzoate, mectinite. And uh, an abamectin, which would be um, your aracinate, uh, if you're familiar with that. Um, same thing here for our sprays, some other active ingredients we didn't really talk about a lot. Spinosad works fantastic. You can get that under the trade name Conserve. Um, Chlorintranilaprol, we did talk about that. Acetamiprid, um, and then that native uh, uh, the Bacillus. Thurgan, I can't say that word. Sorry, but you can read it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, with tree injection, once again, but because we're losing trace with imidacloprid and dinotefuron, these are what we're left with with tree injection. Um, and then for soils, we're losing our imidacloprid and uh, uh, acephate becomes really pretty much the only viable soil application that's systemic that we will have left. And so to wrap up here, um, before we jump into the questions, neonics are a valuable tool. There's no denying that. However, um, some some of us are, are, are you know, our, our use of them is limited. Um, so for those that do still have them as a valuable, as a tool, be sure to be applying them correctly. We don't need any more issues around them any more encouragement for more legislation to be passed around them let's say that um, so make sure we're using these responsibly using our ppe and then also making sure that we're using the products that present the the best possible management but also the lowest risk to ourselves the environment um the public etc um so so not all products are created equal as you we've, we've kind of seen throughout this um, there is no one-to-one -one replacement. We talked about that. It's pretty blatantly obvious. That's why this is such a big deal where these bans are happening. And by utilizing these alternative products, we should still be able to get really, really good control on the majority of our pests, uh, damaging pests. Uh, we just may have to switch up our techniques a little bit. It's probably going to throw a little bit of wrench in your business plan. There's certainly no doubt about that. Um, well, you're not going to get any argument from me. However, we still can provide a very valuable service for our clients, and we can still manage tree health um, in, in big ways with these other products. And so with that, uh, we can start looking at questions. Like I said, this ISA CEU code is literally just for your reference. So feel free to jot it down. 
um, but there's nothing that you need to do. We're going to take care of all of the submission to ISA on our end, um, but uh, there it is for you. In addition, you can see on the left there, that's my uh, phone number and email. If you have questions, if we don't get to them here in the next five, 10 minutes or so, uh, feel free to reach out to me via one of those methods, and I'd, I'd be happy to, to answer any uh, additional questions there. So with that, I'm going to open up our Open Mark, up our. Um, do you want me to help you with questions? Sure. Cool. I'm trying to dig through all of the CEU codes. Okay, so the first two I think are really tied together, but um, talking about what to use for control of voxel leaf miner and lace bugs on Andromedas without Neonics. Uh, yeah, so I, I think we kind of covered that in there. I saw that that was like. Keith, you were on the ball with that one. You put that one in there immediately, and, and I like that. Um, so, I mean, that's where I think like, with box relief minor, Lucid's really going to thrive. And then with lace bugs, your your Lepitec product uh, or or any kind of, um, oh boy, acephate product should should do a really nice job of controlling them as well. And then, of course, we still do have the foliar sprays, but I tried to, you know, with the time, focus on some of the more systemic products that we have. Yeah, so great question, Keith. And then the second question is, what are the issues when using a midocloprid near perennials? Which I think this is a really good one because even in places where neonics have not been banned, this question comes up a lot. Yeah, well, so that's, that is a great question. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer that a little bit vaguely, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer it and you'll see why I'm answering it that way is imidacloprid is certainly impact it can negative it, it can kill pollinators um it does get into the pollen that's why we have these this legislation you know that's why there's restrictions in place and bans in place because the idea is let's preserve our pollinator population which we certainly want to do so anytime you're using imidacloprid around a blooming plant um it's important to understand there will be risks involved. And that's why we always recommend, um, well, by label, you cannot apply these to plants that are blooming. And so if you do have blooming plants, whatever they may be in the app, in the area, in that application area, um, you're gonna have to probably find an alternative because there is certainly a, a good chance of negative pollinator impact. Um, so I think that answers your question, yeah, but, but that's, you. that's why. Yeah. So great okay, we question. Got a funny one. Lepitex smells so bad. I do want to address it though. It does smell bad. Can Rainbow <laughs> do anything about that? <laughs> uh, yeah. So Lepitex smells bad. Team. It does. Um, and <laughs> short answer is no, it's just the nature of that product. Now there are some benefits that come with a product that smells really bad. Is that keeps people away from you because they don't want to smell that any more than they already are. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is something to keep in mind. Storing that stuff in, in, a, in a good way is, is important. Uh, when you put it on your truck, make sure that it, there's nothing nearby that can cut those packages open. Because trust me, I've been on spray rigs where Lepitect has spilled. It's not a nice smell. <laughs> so no, nothing we can do about that. Sorry for now. Maybe Maybe in the future we'll find something, but. Okay, we have a couple questions from Hawaii, and I'm going to put these on as because I know we don't know the answer to them. So, Mary, I see them, and we'll try to reach out to you to do a little investigation. I don't want to waste people's time here. Oh, could you talk about timing for Lepitec for elongate hemlock scale, knowing that those, right, so we've got an emergence of crawlers in May. -ish. I'm just talking about kind of the residual on that. Yeah, so for elongated hemlock scale, that's a that's a great question, and this this goes to you know this is the same for pretty much everything. We want to be targeting the lepitec specifically, knowing that it's going to be in and out pretty quickly. We want to target right around that last immature stage, right as they're kind of settling down and beginning to feed. So with elongated hemlock scale specifically, your timing is probably going to be somewhere in that May-ish area, that late spring, really early summer time frame, um, that's traditionally when we've used products like Dynatefuron, which will control also uh, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. And so we kind of get a one-two punch with Dynatefuron. But when it comes to Lepitect or uh, Acephate, I would say probably that 
mid to late May mm, time frame is probably when we would want to do that, depending on your area, that might change. Yeah, and I will add, you probably need a couple of applications since Lepitech has such a short residual. Um, okay. We have a lot more questions. I don't know how many more you want to take. <clears throat> um, I figure we'll spend another five minutes, so we'll finish right up at quarter of. So we'll just we'll just keep going down the line here and oh, see. Oh, sorry. Okay, Sam had a question. Lepitech, how would you apply that? You can do a soil application for that. Do a soil injection of Lepitech on elongated yeah. hemlock log scale. Do not. Do, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No. Sam. So we got you. <laughs> yeah, with Lepitect, uh, this is something I may have glossed over quickly or may not even have covered, but Lepitect, right now, pretty much you're going to be uh, root flare injecting that or soil injecting it. Yeah. Um, Lepitect, you can no longer foliar spray it. You wouldn't want to do that anyways, because as people have already mentioned, it stinks, uh, but it's not even labeled for that anymore. And you cannot do a soil drench with it either. You have to, um, you have to uh, inject it. So yeah, great questions there saying yeah. thank you thanks for the clarification okay um how what is the residu residual for chlorotronilacryl like uh, specifically roses for japanese beetle um i believe it's about seven to then seven to ten days when uh, applied as a foliar spray um i believe that's what it is um i think that's right too <laughs> i think yeah i think well, yeah <laughs> short as a short okay um do, 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 do. What's the cost difference between a metacloprid and acetate? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. And actually, the cost difference there isn't dramatic. I think acetate, mm, don't quote me on this, but I think acetate might be a little bit more expensive. It's significantly more, but it depends okay. on the rate. Like a metacloprid, yeah. depending on whatever, can be as low as 16 cents a diameter range. And acetate, it's usually like a dollar fifty per inch or something, depending on again, depends on like lower high rate, but it is different. And email us, we can help you do the calculations. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good answer. Um, sales, I don't do much sales, so I sometimes fault <laughs> on those questions. <laughs> um, Great. Yeah. Good question, though. That's that's important. I mean, that's a big deal when it comes to business uh, operations. Any comments on Altus? Altus is a great. Um, that's another. Not many comments. I, I know Altus. I, I've, I've used it briefly years and years ago when it kind of was a little bit newer still. And I, I from what I recall, I remember I think I had really good results on some some tricky scale populations excuse me, with Altus. Um, but it's, uh, to be completely fair, I, it's not a product I'm super familiar with or have a lot of experience with. Um, but I do think it's, it warrants some additional research into it because it could be a, a pretty good product to, to weave yeah. into your operations. From my understanding, it's that sort of middle between imidacloprid and dinotaprin as far as residual length. But I heard that the research team for Rainbow tried to do some testing and we didn't see strong enough um, results with it. So we didn't bring it to market, but that's not to say it's not a good tool. We just don't carry it. So we're not the experts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you know if abamectin is safe for use on citrus varieties to fight leaf miners? Um, so when it comes to any edible root bearing plants, uh, it, I don't think, um, any of our uh, abamectin products are labeled for it, but that's where I would refer to. The, I'm going to refer you to the label on that one. Read through your label. Um, if it's not labeled for it, you can't use it anyways. Um, so refer to your label because there's there might be an abamectin product out there that is, um, but I think the majority of the ones that we use are not labeled for fruit bearing plants. Cool. Okay. This is a good one. Does amamectin benzoate stay in newly emerging pine needles for protection longer than one year? Uh, Allison, do you happen to know that one? So Actually. far, so far only one year, but there's been some new data coming out that suggesting that there may be product that's staying into leaf tissue or moving into new leaf, leaf and needle tissue in the second year. But literally one of Deb McCullough's PhD students in Michigan just published that like a week ago and I just read it. So 
I think the jury's still out on that one. We're still trying to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's do one. Mm, okay, will peroxide help control pernicola scale? We've been using distance with oil, but have been having a hard time controlling this pet. Uh, it should. And I think a lot of times it, timing can be tricky for some of our scales. And so that's an area where potentially um, doing like a dormant oil spray in the winter or, you know, in the, in the dormant season uh, and to supplement that could also help. Um, some scales, I, you know, I think I saw a question about crate myrtle bark scale. Some scales are just extraordinarily difficult. Um, now, you know, as long it would generally with, with correct timing, you can get really good results, but you have super high populations. Uh, sometimes that can create uh, challenges. And also with, with, with pyroproxifen, it's not an immediate kill. So it takes a lot of time sometimes. And I, you know, when I say a lot of time, I'm, I mean, you know, sometimes weeks, maybe a month, uh, because we're not actually killing them. We're just regulating their growth and essentially they're starving to death. Um, a little bit morbid there, but that's how these things work. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, sometimes that also can be misinterpreted as poor control. So uh, not a, not a great answer, but nonetheless, maybe supplementing in, you know, hoard oil sprays in the dormant season could also help manage that population. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm going to do one last one. What alternative product would be good for crepe myrtle bark scale? Currently <laughs> using Zytec. And I assume some folks are using Transtac as well. Yeah. Well, for crepe myrtle bark scale, for one thing, I would definitely recommend if you can use it, dinatefuron in in the in the spring, um, and but also alternative products would be um, peroxide and and oil would would work. Um, Great metal bar scale is is a huge issue though, and and we see insane population jumps with that 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 new invasive pest, relatively new invasive. So uh, that's another one that can be just extremely challenging. I would encourage you to reach out to me uh, or, or the team here. Uh, we can give you a little more information on that. All right, Tom. we've got, uh, well, that's all we've got for questions. I'm gonna address, there's a few in here regarding stuff, questions about regulations in Canada, Hawaii, things like that. Please reach out to us directly. But what I will say is there's one question about grasses in Hawaii. We are not turf experts on this team at all. Um, and a lot of our stuff is not necessarily labeled for turf use either. And then as far as Canada, same thing. Um, we only have two products registered in Canada. So we are not the experts on that. We're happy to help you um, read through any label restrictions that you may have. But I'm going to just say we don't know the answer. So I'm not going to waste our time making Mark yeah. all about Excellent. that. Excellent. Well, yeah, so I appreciate everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, thanks for hanging out a little bit past our time. And uh, yeah, please reach out if you have any questions and uh, we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks everybody.